Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, Holy Messiah in Hebrew. Okay. Just in case. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. All right, well, welcome everybody, Mom, Victor, Chrissy. Um, some of you know Lorenzo, he's been with us before. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, 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 Jeff. Hi, Mom. Hi, Duke. Hi, Hi. Ashley. Hi, Hi Victor. <laughs> <laughs> so praise the living God. Okay. So it's so glad to see everybody today, and uh, thank you, Lorenzo, again for coming. It's good to see you, and um, really, it's a pleasure to see you again. It's been a while, and uh, let's 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 bless the Lord and get into this word. We're starting a new series. Somebody put your hands together. The last one was, uh, <laughs> you know, walking in success, and we had like eight messages. This is walking in the power of God. So if you ever wanted to experience the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and walk in His power. Listen to these stories from the Bible and apply it to yourself. I'd like to use for a title tonight, The Key of David. And let me know if you could hear me good or if anything breaks up or something. But I'd like to use for a title tonight, okay. The Key of David. What was that? Somebody said something. Okay. So let's talk about a key. Um, a key is a symbol of authority. And when you use it to open or close something, it's a symbol of power and access, right? You can get into your house, your safe, your car, whatever. So a key is a symbol of authority. And we're talking about the key of David, of course, King David from the Old Testament. Um, if you have the key of David, then you have control of David's domain. In other words, Jerusalem, the city of David, the kingdom of Israel. Uh, some of you, I mean, most of you have probably seen on TV, some famous person goes to a particular city and the mayor comes out and gives him the key to the city. Yes. Key mm -hmm. to the city. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. So I want you to think of the authority and the power behind the key. So we're going to start in, uh, I'd like to use for a text, First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 11. And we're going to start with verses 1 to 3. Ashley, are you, are you okay to read? Sure thing. <laughs> she knows. Man, I love it. All right. I did. It. I got it ready. <laughs> Chronicle, 1 Chronicles 11, 1 through 3. Then all Israel gathered to David at Hebron, saying, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. In times past, even when Saul was king, it was you who let out and brought in Israel. And the Lord your God said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall be prince and leader over my people Israel. So all of the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and David made a covenant, a solemn agreement, with them there before the Lord, in accordance with the word of the Lord through Samuel. Amen. And go back one line. And they anointed. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was blocked. I was trying to find it. And they anointed him king over Israel in accordance with the word of the Lord through Samuel. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We just love you, Lord. So Chrissy and I watched a movie. It's from 1985. And it's called King David with Richard Gere. Go online, find it or some. It's a great movie, I think about the life of King David, and it's called King David, 1985. So uh, what's interesting here is we know that David was a young teenager when Samuel anointed him, amen? Poured the bottle of oil on him, the horn of oil. He gets anointed to be king, even though it, it was many years later when he became king. And so that was his first anointing. Then later he became the king of Judah, and the people of Judah anointed him to be king of Judah. So that was the second anointing. I should have started with a question. How many times was David anointed? And the answer is three times. So now we're going to get into yeah. First Chronicles 11. And the 10 northern tribes had separated from Judah and Benjamin in the south. So David wasn't their king. So after seven years of being king for Judah, 
the 10 northern tribes say, hey, we want you to be our king too. So now you got the whole 12 tribes and they anoint David. So David had three anointings. He was anointed three times, once by Samuel, once by Judah, and once by the elders of Israel. Okay, so then Brother Duke is going to read. Hey, Pastor Paul. Somebody put your hands together for Pastor Paul. Hey. Awesome. Good to see you. <laughs> All right, so uh, we just started Pastor Paul, so we're in First Chronicles chapter 11, and Duke, would you do us the honors? Yes. Then David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, that is Jebus, and the uh, Jebusites and Jebusites and inhabitants of the land were there. Then the Jebusites said to David, you shall not come in here. But David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David said, whoever strikes down a Jebusite first shall be chief and commander. Joab, the son of Zerah, Zura, David's half-sister, went up first, and so he was made chief. Then David lived in the stronghold, so it was called the city of David. He built the city around it from the Milo fortification to the surrounding area, and Joab repaired the rest of the old Jebusite city. David became greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. Amen and amen. All right, so we're talking about King David. He's king over Judah for seven years. Then the 10 northern tribes come down. They say, hey, we want you to be our king too. They anoint him with oil, make a covenant. Now David is the king over the whole combined 12 tribes. So we're going to read two passages. We just read one. This is in First Chronicles chapter 11. You know, just like you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some of them tell the similar stories. We just read First Chronicles 11. This is the story of after David's anointed, he's going to go to Jerusalem to take it back. And so that's going to be his White House. That's going to be his capital. But the Jebusites live there, and these were evil Canaanite idolatrous people. So there's two different sections in Scripture that says the same story. So we read one in First Chronicles, and this one I specifically put in because David wants somebody to capture Jerusalem, to get in. Nobody has ever dominated and controlled Israel. Even Joshua, when they had the conquest, when they came over the Jordan after Moses, he wipes out 31 kings. He was able to beat the Jebusites, but he wasn't able to extract them. He wasn't able to kick them out. So Jerusalem, inhabited by the Jebusites, has been an impenetrable force, and they represent evil demon spirits. All right, so then David says, whoever can strike down a Jebusite first is going to be the chief and commander, the commander-in-chief of the army. He's given a blessing. If you could take them out. This is what's going to happen. So this is First Chronicles. Now we're going to read another place, which is Second Samuel, chapter five. Uh, Jeff Walker, can you read this for us? Sure. Wait a minute. Okay. Now the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who sold David, David. who who oh, said David. Excuse me. Uh, you shall not enter here, for the blind and the lame, even the weakest among us, will turn you away. They thought David cannot come in here because the walls are impenetrable. Nevertheless, David captured the strongest fortress of Zion, that is, the city of David. And then David said on that day, Whoever strike the Jebusites, let him go up through the underground water uh, let me move this, uh, shaft to strike the lame and the blind who are defense detested. detested by David, David's soul, because of their arrogance. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. So again, First Chronicles, it's going to bring up the fact that 
David puts an announcement to all his mighty men. Hey, whoever could take over the stronghold, this fortress, this castle, and kill the Jebusites, you're going to be the commander in chief. So Joab, he goes up first and he's going to do the job. He's going to win. He's going to become the commander of, all, of the whole Israeli army. And then in this section here, it talks about that David has a supernatural revelation from God that the way you could take this city is you got to go underground through a water shaft. So this is like a military cool, think of an action movie. David says, if you want to be able to take the Jebusites, you got to go down. You can't go up. You got to go down into this water shaft. And, um, and what they said is it was such a strong fortified city that even the blind and the lame could hold off the whole Israeli army. So they're insulting David. They're insulting David's God. And that's why it says he detests them. And some other scriptures say they detested him because they were idolaters and David hated idolatry. All right, let's, of course, I'm going to bring a couple of maps. So this is where David uh, was ruling and reigning as, of king, as king in Hebron over Judah. And then the 10 northern tribes come down and they all anoint him. Now it's the whole Israeli force, the 12 tribes, and now they're going to go to Jerusalem. So the, the king and all the men go to Jerusalem. And when they get there, there's this fort up on Mount Zion. It's built on rock. It's got almost vertical cliffs. It's got deep valleys. There is no way to penetrate this fortress. It's called a citadel or a fortress, um, a, a castle. You can't get in it. And they were so confident because nobody in history could penetrate it and then get the Jebusites out. Not even Joshua. Okay. So now they they make this trip to Jerusalem, might be 10, 15 miles. And here's a little picture, if you will, this dotted line over here and over here, that represents the walls of this fortress, the walls of the city that you're not getting in. There's just no way, it's never been done. But there's this Jebusite water tunnel here. And David almost prophesied to them. He says, whoever wants to capture the city, because he gave the challenge, whoever win captures the city, any of my great men, you're going to be the commander in chief. The mm -hmm. only way to get there, you can't go through the walls. Some of you are facing some struggles in your life right now. And you think, I got to go this way. Let the Holy Ghost tell you which way to go. Amen. So David says, you're going to have to go through the underground aqueduct. So they're going to have to follow this red thing. You're going to go under this wall next to the Gihon Spring. Then it goes this way. And this was found, I think, in 1950s. They actually found this underground aqueduct. And I'm going to talk to you about it. But you go underground and you get inside the fortress. Once you're in there, there's an iron gate. And these iron gates had iron bars. And the bars had latches with locks. So you needed the key to the gate to unlock the bolts so you could pull out the, the bars and then you could open the gate. And once you open the gate, then of course armies can come in or out. Who's with me? Anybody with me? Amen. Okay. Yes, with you. So let's just stay there for a minute. So we talked about um, this originally was called Salem in, in Genesis. And then later it became Jeru. Salem, right? Which Salem means peace. Well, the Jebusites, um, they were one of 10 Canaanite heathen nations. These were un these were enemies against God, not just ungodly, but directly against God. It was one pagan. of the 10 pagan to the bone. Yes, sir. So the Jebusite, the word Jebusite means this, to tread down underfoot, to pollute, to defile, the holy things of God. Amen? To tread down yeah. underfoot, to pollute, to defile the holy things of God. And today we have Jebusite spirits. These are demon spirits that try to block you from God's best in your life. They try to trod you, trod you underfoot, pollute you, and defile uh, your body and your temple and so forth. So in Joshua, it says that when they came across the Jordan, wiped out 31 kings, it says in Joshua 15, verse 63, for my note takers, that the children 
of Judah could not drive them out. They were squatters living on God's property. Amen. So Zion here, this whole this whole fortress is on top of a mountain, a solid rock mountain. Like I said, it has defensive walls, steep hills, valleys. It's impenetrable. You can't penetrate it. So David, though, told his men, and it's believed by the Holy Ghost, you got to go through the water shaft, or as my brother calls it, the aqueduct. And this was discovered. You can't see it on my screen. It's at the top. It's called Warren's Shaft. And I don't know much. You could Google it. Some guy that researched this a couple of decades ago. And he found it. He found this, this, this way to get through the stronghold. David knew it 3,000 years ago by the Holy Ghost. But now David says, whoever can get through this, if you could do it, I'm going to make you the commander in chief. So let's talk about this. If you went into um, First Chronicles chapter 11, it's going to tell you about this story. But what's interesting, it's going to tell you about David's mighty men. He had 30 of David's mighty men and two sets of three. He had the top three here and a second rank three here. So he just had great men. Let's talk about that for a minute. One man's name was, it's tattooed on my brother's back. Victor, what's his name? Adino. How many people did he kill in one time? 800. Oh, yeah. You can tell he's got a tattoo. You better know the number. Adino, Whoa. empowered by the Holy Ghost, wipes out 800 men in one combat. There's only one guy that beat that record. Who was it? Samson. Samson. How many? With a donkey jawbone. Yep, the jawbone of an ass. Next was Eleazar. Eleazar lifted up his sword in combat. And I'm not talking about just natural feats. These men were supernaturally empowered to defend God's honor, just like David when he killed Goliath. That wasn't a typical little boy with a slingshot. That was the Holy Ghost. So Eliezer fought, fought the Philistines, and he fought with such intensity that when he was done wiping them out, his hand wouldn't let go of the sword. It was stuck. Modern medicine, and I forgot the name of this, is a term for that where your hand can be fused to, to a sword. You can't, you can't, you have to go to the hospital. It ain't coming off. Eliezer experienced that in the Holy Ghost. He wipes out the enemy. Next was Shama. It was lentil season, and the Philistines came to take their food. All of Israel fled. They were afraid. Shama is the one guy. He stays there, wipes them out, defends the little lentil field, and the Bible says God wrought a great victory. These are great, great men of God used by the Holy Spirit. This is my favorite one. There were three of the top 30, three of David's men. Uh, once he was in the cave of Adjulam. And when he was there, David, it was a desert. So David says, man, I, he says, I wish I had some of the water from the well that is by Bethlehem. And this shows the heart of a warrior. His warriors hear David, their king, who's a type of Jesus, right? His warriors here, David says, I wish I had a glass of water from the well mm -hmm. at Bethlehem. But the problem was the Philistines were there. They had a fortress there and they had uh, they had like a couple of platoons of men. So you, you can't just go get that water. These three men were so passionate for their king that they broke through the garrison, broke through the band of the Philistines. We talked about this about a year ago. They get through the whole army, three men. They get a glass of water, they turn around, and now they got to get out. So they get out through the fort, they get out through the through the garrison, through the platoon, through all the Philistines, and they bring David the glass of water. Do you know what the Philistines saw when they saw that? You, you got some bad to the bone warriors. They will <laughs> risk their life just to bring a glass of water to their king. I, I don't know about you, I wouldn't want to fight them. So, and then David takes the water and he says, I can't drink it. This is like the blood of these men. They risk their lives. And he pours it out as a sacrifice to God. Imagine oh. what the devil saw and the Philistines. These guys have a level of dedication and commitment. We don't even know what that is. It's called a blood covenant with God. 
Amen. The honor of imagination. Amen. Abisha is another man. He killed 300 men. Benaniah, one of my favorites, he killed two uh, lion-like warriors from Moab. He also killed an Egyptian that was seven foot five. He took the Egyptian. Isn't there a song about him? Uh, Isn't there, there a be. song about Benaniah? Uh, there might be. I don't I don't know of it, but I, there might be. I believe so. I'm going to look it up later. All right. Praise the Lord. So he he uh, he takes a, a spear and he disarms the Egyptian, who's about seven foot five inches tall, takes his spear away, takes it and kills the Egyptian with his own spear. And then he's so full of the Holy Ghost, he jumps in a pit on a snowy day. That means you don't want to go to combat. And there was a lion in the pit. He jumps in the pit. I can I get I get uh, Daniel. He said, stop praying or we're going to put you in the lion's den. But Daniel didn't jump in the lion's den. They made him go. This guy jumps in the pit. I'm talking about people that have a passion for God. These are warriors of God. Hallelujah. All mm -hmm. right. Why, why did I say all that? Because we got an issue going on here. David says, I got all my mighty men. I've just been anointed by Israel, right? We're here at, at, at Jerusalem. It's impenetrable. The man that can get in there and take this thing over, you're going to be the, the, the commander in chief over everybody I just mentioned. Amen. I, I, have, a question, I have a question to ask. Um, yeah. You know, uh, we, we talk about uh, the city of David being Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I always thought it was uh, Bethlehem. Um, nope. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. It's it's actually this map that I just showed you where Zion, Jerusalem's built on two actual like mountain peaks, so to speak. Zion and there's another one that I just read before also. But uh -huh. he, it's not called the city of David till he takes it over. Um, okay. But good question. So over here, I'm going back to First Chronicles. You see Joab, David's half sister, son of David went up first, and so he was made chief. So I want to talk about what Joab had to do, and I'm comparing him to these incredible, mighty warriors that are standing by his side. Is anybody with me? Yeah. And yet Amen. Joab ends up being the guy that's going to become the commander-in-chief. All right, number one, what does uh, Joab's name mean? And I'll tell you. Joab's name means Yahweh is father okay. no way the lord is my father what does that say to me he had an intimate cool. relationship with god the father an intimate yeah. close relationship or you ain't going to do these acts of feats of supernatural ability joab had that anointing joab had that relationship with god okay the book of daniel says that it shall come to pass in the last days saith god uh, that the people that do know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. Come on, Mom. Exploits. There it is. All right. So David told them what to do. What did he say? He said, whoever strikes the Jebusites, let him go through the underground water shaft. Remember, David's a prophet. Also, he's not just a warrior and a king. He's a prophet. He's telling them what they need to do. So Underground, there's a network of channels or a water shaft, like I showed you that picture here. You got the Jebusite water tunnel, Gihon Springs. There's these underground things that they recently, like I said, have found out. So I want you to think of Joab. It's probably at night, I don't know. But either way, he's going to follow, he's going to go down into this tunnel. He's going to descend, think of a well. He's going to go through the shaft. And then he's going to follow this tunnel underground, but it's very deep. There's no light. He is in the dark. Hey, guys, they didn't have flashlights. There's no starlight for moonlight. He's underground in the shaft. He goes down first, and then he follows the water. Listen to this, what they found out through excavation. As he's going this way, he's on his back, okay? It's 14 inches of distance from the top to the bottom of this 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 horizontal uh, flow of water. Well, it's 14 inches, but the water is about 10 inches deep. So if you're on your back, 
the water is going to come up almost to your nose and you got four inches to breathe. And then you got to okay. start backpedaling on your back all the way this way. I don't know about you. That that sounds a little uh, little concerning, a little nervous, yeah. right? Whatever you want to call it. So right. uh, he goes that way. And then he makes this turn by Gihon Springs. And he goes under the wall <laughs> twice from what we're saying. But then when he gets on the other side of the wall, and by the way, they had somebody try this. It took four hours. Get on your back, back pedal with four inches to breathe. It took four hours to go this red distance. But now, once you're inside the other way, you're at the bottom. So now you're inside the fort, the walls, you know, you're inside the walls, but you're underground. So now you got to climb up. And it ain't like you had climbing equipment. Amen. Mm -hmm. So now Joab has to climb up. We don't know if he had some men with him or not, but he for sure did it. So now he has to climb up through the shaft or the aqueduct. And once he gets to the top, he's got to open the gate. But to open these iron gates, you need to have a key. You got it. I don't know about you. <laughs> this guy is bad. I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say or allowed to say bad to the bone, but woo! in dark, four hours, I can't see. There's no flashlights. You know, you, you're, you're about to drown. This is insane, right? But he's empowered and he's in inspired by the Holy Ghost, and he's with King David. And King David's anointed. So anyway, he finally gets up there. He gets to the top, opens the gates, and once he opens, unlocks the the, the the lock, he opens the bolt, pulls out the bars, open the gates, amen, and then Israel can come in. And at that point, David, it's, he gets the credit, but David takes the stronghold of Zion. In other words, the castle. There's actually a castle. It becomes... David's. Somebody say amen. 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 So now the key to, to Zion, and, and this is when he names it. Now it's named the, the strong, the city of David, because nobody ever could take it, but David and his mighty men could. So the key to Zion represents the key to the governmental authority of the Davidic kingdom. It was prophesied to David that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come, and he does. A thousand years later, Jesus, the Lord Jesus comes, uh, and he's the son of David. And you'll remember blind men like blind Bartimaeus, they would cry out when they heard Jesus was in town and they couldn't see. And they'd say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. What were they saying? You are the Messiah. Woo! Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, uh, you can research this more. There's a famous historian back then named Josephus, and uh, they believed it was an underground passage. It was like honeycomb tunnels. It was confirmed by the discoveries by Sir C. Warren. Sir C. Warren, he's the guy that discovered it last 100 years. And uh, like I said, that's where you get the 14 inches. You got four inches to breathe. I think I didn't mention it. It was like 67 feet. I think after you got to the Gihon Springs, it was another 67 feet. Then you had to come up vertical. And I nowhere in scripture does it say he found the key or it doesn't give you all that description. We just know he did it. So even if he didn't find a physical key, he certainly uh, had found one symbolically because he was able to open the gates. So this was a, one of the greatest uh, uh, feats of any uh, man of God in the Old Testament there. Um. There's more information about it. I'm going to pass, pass it for now. But like I said, another 67 feet. Then you're over here, but you still got to come up from the ground and ascend and get the, get the whole thing open. All right, so let's move on. What does that say to me? Check this out. A thousand years later, there's a Jewish carpenter who goes, he's he crucified, dead, buried, Jesus Christ. He rises from the dead. He appears to John in the island of Patmos. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 13, and it says, And the angel or divine messenger of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of the Holy One. This means God, God the Son. The true one. Again, God the Son. He who has the key to the house of? David. 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 He who opens and no one is able to shut, and he who shuts 
and no one is able to open. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So David, uh, Jesus here claims that I have the key of David. And again, a key means superintendence. It means authority. It means power. Somebody say amen. 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 Um, amen. And then I'm going to go to another verse. In ver chapter one of Revelation, John sees Jesus and he there's so much power, he falls at his feet like a dead man. And he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. I want you in your mind. Bless the picture, beard. Holy name. Amen. I, I want you to picture Joab. He's underground in complete darkness, four inches away from drowning. Amen. And compare him to Jesus, who the Bible says in Ephesians, he descended to the depths of hell after he died and was buried. His spirit and soul goes to hell. Just as Joab had to ascend, okay, and, and rise up through that water shaft, Jesus also had to ascend and rise up through the shaft of hell to the tomb and come out and say, and say these words, behold, I have the keys of hell and of death. It's an amazing parallel, an amazing story of what the Lord did for us. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise God. Praise, praise the God. Lord. Okay. And then lastly, I'm going to go to Matthew. So we talked about David and that whole thing with the key of David and authority and access. Then we talked about Jesus basically doing the same thing. He had to descend and then ascend just like Joab did. And then he gets the keys of the kingdom, but it doesn't really stop there because Jesus didn't get those keys just for himself. Jesus got the keys of hell and death and he did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for his body, the Christians, the believers. Let's yeah. see what he says. Matthew 16, 18. He tells Peter that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates, you see all the gates in this? The gates of hell, just like Job had to go through, uh, Joab had to go through gates. Jesus went through gates. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I want you to understand the Greek language here. It's not that the gates of hell are attacking you and, and they can't beat you. What it means is that you are attacking the gates of hell and they can't hold out against you. Somebody say amen. 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 So the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The church is going to attack the devil. The church is going to attack the gates of hell. And the way we're going to do it is with authority that Jesus gives us. Verse 19, he says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever Woo! thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, hold that thought for a minute. If you do a little Greek research on this study, it's not that you're going to say, hey, I'm deciding that this is legal and this is not legal. What it's really <laughs> saying in the original language is whatsoever is already illegal, unlawful, or improper. That's what the word to bind something means, to declare it illegal. Everybody say illegal. 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 Unlawful. Unlawful. And, imp and improper. Improper. Right. So whatever is already declared illegal, unlawful, and improper in heaven, you are the enforcement agency. We are as the church. We on earth say, devil, I bind you. What are you saying? I declare you illegal, unlawful, and improper. And then whatever is legal, lawful, and proper, the opposite in heaven, that's what we as the enforcement agency on earth as the church, we declare things legal, lawful, and proper. For example, this morning I was praying, seeking God, and a lot of times towards the end of my prayer, not always, but a lot of times, 
I just come against the devil. Matter of fact, hold on. Stay right there. How about I do this? I just want to share how I pray. Everybody, you want to dwell in prayer. Mm -hmm. I actually have some notes sometimes when I'm praying, and I think it's good. You ready? Here's what I do. So when, I, when I'm done and I'm going to bind the devil, I say this, Satan, I come against you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. I come against Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. I declare, declare you illegal, unlawful, and improper. I take authority over you. I take authority over the kingdom of darkness. I take authority over the gates of hell. I take authority over principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Devil, I bind you. I declare you illegal, unlawful, and proper. I come against sickness, disease, infirmity, plagues, and pestilences, fear, doubt, unbelief, the wild strategies, tactics, and devices of the devil. I bind you, devil, in Jesus' name. And usually oh, I do man, that in just a couple man. of minutes. You, you don't got to park there for an hour. He knows when he's getting beat. And then I do some loosing. So I'll say, Father, in, in the name of Jesus, I loose the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in my life and my loved ones. This I want you guys to know I pray for you. Everybody that's on here, I, we pray for each other. Thank but you. you're you're lifted up in prayer. I, I, mm. I loose the body, blood, name, spirit, power, word, and presence of Jesus. I loose, declare it legal, lawful, and proper for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. I loose the kingdom of God. I, I even go in heaven. I loose the four living creatures, 24 elders, seraphim and cherubim, which means the burning ones. I loose Michael, Gabriel, the, the ministering spirits, the winds of fire. I loose the body of Christ. I loose the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. I loose the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Ah, in the name of Jesus, I loose the gifts of the Holy Ghost, uh, the word Woo! of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discerning the spirits, tongues, interpretation, tongues, prophecy, faith, gifts, healings, working of miracles. I loose the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. I loose the ministries of Jesus. I loose the operation of the Father. Devil, get nervous because I loose the armor of God. I thank you, Lord. My loins are girt about with truth. Uh, have on the breastplate of righteousness. My feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Have the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and sword of the spirit. Right about Woo! there, I start running up and down, and I got 220-pound pit bulls, and they start barking <laughs> in the background. They want a piece. <laughs> Let me loose. Let me out. Yeah. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's, All right. That's I got a little, I, I, the I hounds got a little, of heaven. Yeah, the hounds of heaven. I got a little carried away there. But <laughs> praise God, you have the keys of the kingdom of God. And if God did it for David, he's going to do And he did it for Jesus. He's going to do it for you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Steve. Which one do? The one, for, uh, I forget his name from Fort Lauderdale, David, that was talking to ask about Bethlehem. And the city of David, I looked it up while we were 